Sometimes people think, oh, technology, yes, I need to offer my fees lower at a lower rate to be more competitive. It's not about that. It's all about focusing on how to better service the client and, and, and just, you know, you know, trying to get them in and out as quickly as possible. And, and then they become raving fans, right? They, you know, they, they then are your best marketers. And so I've never been a paid, paid marketing kind of guy. I've, you know, when you provide awesome service, the thing that's going to separate us uh, firms that are client centered from those that aren't is the referrals. I'm Jack Newton, CEO of Clio, and this is the Daily Matters podcast. On Daily Matters, we talk with legal professionals, industry leaders, and subject matter experts about the future of law. We explore where the legal industry is headed, how legal practice is changing, and what you can be doing to position yourself for success. This episode of Daily Matters is brought to you by the 2020 Clio Cloud Conference, the world's best legal conference, featuring keynote speakers Seth Godin, Angela Duckworth, and Ben Crump. The conference will take place virtually from October 13th to 16th. Get your passes now before it's too late at cleocloudconference.com. Today's guest is Mark Holfi, founder and chief inspirational officer at Holfi Immigration Law, a boutique immigration firm in Canada. Mark is also the host of the Canadian Immigration Podcast on iTunes, and Holfi Immigration Law is a nominee for the 2020 Reisman Award for Best New Law Firm. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jack. Happy to be here. So, Mark, for starters, can you give us some background on your career path and how you came to found Holfi Immigration Law? Yeah, I think, Jack, we'd probably need a, an entire episode to talk about the path that I've taken, but it's been very diverse. So I've practiced in pretty much every configuration of a law firm you can imagine, national, regional, full service, solo, and uh, finally arriving at my current configuration, which is an amazing little virtual firm that uh, has lawyers practicing out of their homes. So. And tell me a bit about the firm. How, how, how large is the firm? Uh, what was the, the, the path to get to the point you are at today? Yeah, that's, a, that's another good question. So I reached a stage, I was previously at a full service firm. And uh, as I looked at my client base, I realized that 95% of them were not in my city. I interacted with them virtually. And, um, and there was obviously challenges sometimes with immigration, uh, you know, meshing with the systems and, and processes that you need to operate efficiently as an immigration firm, it doesn't always uh, mesh with the other areas of practice. And so I decided to uh, strike out on my own and set up a virtual firm. And that was actually in December. And now hindsight, I'm thinking, wow, hey, that was, that was a pretty good deal, given what we know now. Right. And, um, and so there was a whole bunch of reasons why I decided to do it. But, uh, but the most important was I just wasn't happy with the way I was servicing my clients. I hated the traditional model of, of practice where you leveraged off of paralegals and assistants. And I just wanted to work directly with them. And by eliminating a lot of that overhead, setting up my office in my home, which is basically I started with just myself in, Dece in December, no one else. Um, yeah, I, I was able to figure out a, a different way of practice through the use of good software programs like Clio. And uh, now I've just been adding lawyers as quickly as I can. So I have who do the same thing as I do work out of their homes. So I have, uh, I've got two other associate lawyers right now and, um, and we're actively growing. So that's kind of the configuration right now. So you, you've developed a virtual law firm with a, an innovative approach to client service. Can you tell us some of the things that, that you do to set your practice apart and some of the things you're doing that are, are innovative when, with respect to client service? Yeah, I think the best place to start is just to describe the way it was, the way it's always been, which has been lawyers who have paralegals, who interact with the clients, everything is pushed down to the least expensive unit in the firm. And uh, those paralegals, your practice really rested on how good they were. And so you'd spend years training them and they would be the ones that would interact with the clients, help them to put their application forms together. And then it would come to the lawyer to review and submit. And over the last few years, Canadian immigration has become ruthless. So any slight mistake in the applications would get them returned. And you know all of the corresponding consequences that flowed from that and um, and so I realized that my paralegals just never cared as much as I did about the process. And by the time it came to me, if there was something that was missing, it was often at the very, very last stage, clients weren't happy. So it was all about just 
being a better service provider. And uh, I've always been a lawyer that cares about my clients. So money has been secondary and being the best provider I can has always been paramount. So what I realized is that I could practice in a way um, that didn't require a paralegal. And all I needed to do was to make my clients my paralegals. So that required educating them, teaching them. So really my ideal client is kind of a DIYer at heart who, who really wants to learn and wants to understand. And, uh, and then I set them up so that they are able to start the first draft of the application. I've got some DIY guides and things that I help them to prepare. And we have shared folders. They upload their documents to it. And then we schedule virtual meetings where we share screens. And the best part, Jack, about this whole process is that I may miss things. Like we're not perfect. And the client may very well miss things. But when we're both looking at the same application um, and I say, why did you put this information in this box? And they say, well, I thought it meant this. And I can tell them, well, an officer is going to interpret it like this. We need to change it. We change it right on the spot. It's so much better. The final product is so much better and it's more efficient. There's no waste. You know, you, you think about these lean manufacturing principles and everything we can to try to, you know, make our, our, our practices more efficient. Well, having very little delay on my end within my office has made all the difference for my clients. And it, it proceeds forward as fast as they can get their documents together and get that first draft together. So it's really collaborative. It's, um, it relies on them to take ownership. And at the end of the day, we provide all the support that they need all the way up to preparing and submitting the application. And then they carry and drive the ship forward after that. So it's, uh, yeah, that's basically in, in a nutshell how we, how we operate. And when you think about this model and, and the requirement to find, it, it sounds like clients that are kind of the right fit for that model, which isn't, which isn't every client, you know, it sounds like you've got a very good idea of what makes a perfect client for, for you as, that, as you put it, kind of a bit more of a D uh, do it yourself or kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, how do you screen for that? How, how do you kind of find clients or, or what do you do in your marketing or yeah. client acquisition strategies to draw those, those types of clients to your firm? Yeah, exactly. This is, th this is the secret sauce really. And it's not really secret anymore, but it's all about content marketing, right? I have always been a person who's loved to teach and to instruct and help. And so it's so natural for me to go, I've created the Canadian Immigration Institute as a, as an entity to teach and, I, every week I, I do a live Q and A's, you know, all of those things that we're seeing all of the other industries do, but no lawyers. Well, we're starting to become more and more of us who are willing to just give information away for free. But you know, when I started this three, four years ago, uh, it was a foreign concept to imagine just giving away everything, you know, for free. And then, right. you know, what are you going to charge? You know, why would people want to hire you if you're giving it all away for free, which of course, anyone who pays attention now understands that it's all about, building that platform, establishing yourself as an authority. So all of those videos that I post online, the Facebook, the YouTube, it brings in these people that are my ideal clients. And then all I have to do is set up my interface on my website. I only point them to that and I don't do a lot of other marketing. So there's not a lot of passive marketing that I do or paid, you know, advertisements that I post and maybe I'll start to get into that. But these are people that have been curated for a year or two years who know, like, and trust me. And, you know, I was looking at the Clio Grow interface and the conversion rates are around 35% of people who reach out, you know, with no contact who, who then book a consult. And that's all because of the, you know, the relationship I've built with them before they ever contact our firm. And it's farming, right? It's not hunting, it's farming. So you're planting the seeds and maybe they're two, three years in the making. And that was the biggest thing because when I first started it, I wasn't getting results. And my staff who are no longer with me kept telling me to stop. Don't do it. You're wasting your time. You're spending hours curating a private Facebook group, answering questions, and you're getting nothing from it. And then it just hit that sweet spot, which anyone who's, who does this knows. And then it just, it's, you know, it's that flywheel. It just takes a little bit of a a push to keep it going. So yeah, that's the it's so interesting chatting with you, Mark. Uh, I earlier today interviewed Seth Godin, who will be speaking at the Clio Cloud Conference. And of course, one of the you know greatest minds in the world when it comes to marketing. Mm -hmm. And he yeah, he he advocates exactly what you just laid out. He said put it, put your knowledge out there for the world. You know, share it. 
establish yourself as an expert and see what that draws in. You know, does, does that have uh, gravity or, or, or not? And if it doesn't, may, maybe you're not the expert you, you thought you were, but it was such an interesting uh, perspective that I think very much fits in with, uh, with how you're framing your strategic approach to, to building clients. And you, you also have a, a, a podcast, uh, the Canadian Immigration Podcast. Tell me how that fits into your, your broader strategy as well. Yeah. So like most of us, as the technology advanced and the opportunities to, to share the knowledge you have through different medium, um, the podcast was the, 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 the next step from blogging. So you, you write some blogs on a website, it crashes your website. Wow, I guess people want to hear about that. And at the time when I started it, I think it was back in 2014 is when I first did my first episode. Um, I had this string of clients that were coming into my office with the same problem. And often by the time they booked the consult, I couldn't help them because they'd made all the mistakes. And it was basically, I was singing happy trails to them as, as they were going to have to leave Canada. And I realized that if I started a podcast, I could share that message out there. And yes, I wouldn't result in me getting any money, but it would give them an opportunity to understand what they needed to do in advance. And it was more just a way of, of, of eliminating this steady stream of people who would pay for the consult. I couldn't help them. And then I felt guilty keeping the fee. And so it was more to kind of carve out, okay, I can't help you guys, but here's a way that I can. And, uh, and so the podcast started. And then I realized that it's way better to have an interview style podcast where I'm inviting my friends and colleagues across the country to join me than me blither on, you know, it gets old listening to myself talk. Although I think anyone who podcasts, you don't have a problem listening to yourself speak, but uh, for audiences, it can get kind of dry. So I was, I remember the day too, when I decided to make that shift, I was at one of our national Canadian bar association conferences. And now I'm serving as the national chair, which is an awesome, awesome platform. But um, I realized all of these lawyers were doing these phenomenal presentations that were reaching 30 or 40 people or even a hundred. And so I invited them to take that message they'd already prepared, come and join me on the podcast. And then I just promote the heck out of them. So it was all just a way of giving back. And I've never really marketed on the podcast. It's all designed to just give back to my colleagues that are doing it the right way. Love it. And when you think about the, uh, the virtual aspects of your, your law firm, uh, this is something obviously that many law firms have been, been foisted into, you know, reacting to COVID rather than something they did by design as, as you did when you, you launched the current incarnation of your law firm. Tell us how you think about um, delivering legal services online and especially immigration law, you, you think about it as one of these kind of emotionally high stakes practice areas that maybe you need to be having the traditional face-to-face -face meetings and, and so on. And obviously you saw a world where that didn't need to be the, the case. Tell, tell me a little bit about how your clients have responded and, and what you've found to be some important learnings about running a, a virtual law firm. Yeah. And this goes back to the traditional way of practice, right? Your client comes into your office. You need that face-to-face -face interaction in person for them to really build that connection. And I've, I've, I've listened to lots of podcasts. I've read lots of things about this. And I think it really depends on the area of practice. But for immigration, it's virtual by its very nature. It's been virtual for years where lawyers had overseas agents, which would interact with the clients. And uh, all that's changed now is that I have the ability now to see my clients face to face versus over the phone. And so through the use of video technology and screen sharing, which has really revolutionized my practice, um, the, the whole nature of what we do has, uh, has just been a seamless natural progression. There hasn't been any weird shift that now we're trying to convince our clients that this is the best way of doing it. I've just, and I guess the most important thing to realize too is that you're constantly evolving. What you're using now, you know, you think it's pretty good. You'll always stumble on something that just helps you to just provide the service in a little bit more efficient way, you know, and we're learning even as a firm within the last six months or seven, I, I guess we're almost 10 months now. Um, we've had to make some significant shifts in the software that we use and different pro, you know, different um, tools that we use just because we found out that it couldn't quite do what we wanted it to do. So that level of adaptation is all focused on making the client experience better. And if they're struggling with something, okay, well then what are we doing wrong? What can we fix? What can we change to make that process easier for them? And, you know, with broadband and, and, you know, all over the world becoming more accessible, it's not as great of an issue with, 
you know, you being, you know, for me with my clients uh, interacting with us from all over the world, you know, broadband is pretty broad globally now. So that's no longer uh, the barrier that it might've been in the past where you needed someone on the ground because they didn't have a phone or a computer or something to connect. You talked about the client experience and being really laser focused on iteratively improving that uh, over over time. Uh, obviously at Clio, we talk a lot about the client-centered legal practice. Uh, I, I wrote a book recently focused on this entire topic. Um, so, so being client-centric, I, I really believe is the 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 way of the the future and what will separate uh, the the law firms that thrive from the the law firms that uh, that struggle. Can, can you talk about what this looks like in in your law firm? How do you think in a a client-centered way, and how how, how do you how do you approach the the process of um, iterating? progressively on how you're delivering an increasingly client-centered experience. Yeah. So feedback is critical. So getting that, you know, the feedback from our clients, and we don't necessarily need a formal survey at the end, which rarely do they fill out. We, we monitor the experience. We monitor the interaction with our clients. You know, when they express frustration, we, we figure out, okay, well, where did that come from? So we're constantly looking and evaluating the process. When I started the firm, I sat back and I really, really thought hard about this whole concept of client-centered. What does it mean? Like, because everybody gives lip service to it, right? Every firm is all about the client and yes, but in the end, it's all about profits. And so I, I, I stood back and I said, okay, what is different? And, and this is where the whole concept of understanding my client that they're DIYers at heart. I didn't end with just client-centered, but I added firm supported onto the end of that. So that's kind of our... You know, that's our motto, client-centered, firm-supported. So it's all designed to help them in their journey versus them conforming to our systems and processes. So sometimes people reach out to me and they'll say, hey, I actually want to connect with Zoom versus Microsoft Teams. And ours is, you know, and some people say they want to, you know, communicate versus Skype. So we have all of these different systems in place so that we can quickly switch to whatever they're most comfortable with. And it's not hard. But those little tiny things where we're accommodating for them make all the difference in the world. And like you said, firms that adopt this approach are going to succeed and those that don't won't. Like we are, we're, what's my focus? It's Amazon, right? I want to be Amazon. I want to be able to, to provide this service as quickly, faster than they could ever expect. Get, you know, getting them the result, getting them the service where they don't have to wait. And right now, like many firms, the growing pain that we're going through is now clients have to wait a week before they can book a consult with me. So how, what I'm, we're, we're struggling now, okay, how, how can we do this so that they can get a lawyer tomorrow instead of having to wait? And uh, those are just some of the realities of growth. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my thoughts. So tell me a bit more about the, the growth you've seen. You've been seeing impressive growth. Uh, you've been seeing success as well. You were recently voted by your peers as lawyer of the year for, for immigration. So congratulations on, on that. I think especially recognition from your peers must be uh, something that, that's meaningful for you. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, number one, to hear how it's going. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, the growth you've seen. But I'm also curious to, to hear more about how you think about success in your, your, your firm. Um, is, is there a place that, that you find a, a special place of satisfaction and, and you have an end point that you're trying to get to in terms of uh, what you would count as, as the ultimate success in, in building your law firm out? Yeah, I think, you know, when you have big plans, you know, the end, the end goal is to take over the world, right? I want to completely transform the way immigration law is practiced in Canada. That's my goal. I want to, um, you know, help my other fellow colleagues realize, and we're in this world of access to justice, and that's one of the biggest issues. In our practice, we have non-lawyers that form actually a larger portion of our market share. And, um, and unless we as lawyers change, immigration lawyers, our, our share of that, that market is going to shrink and shrink and shrink. And so, what is success for me? I, like I said, the money always follows, right? It always does. So when I have, um, when I have clients that are coming into the firm, you know, one of the most amazing things is the volume that I'm able to take on with so, you know, with, with a much lower cost basis. 
So I've been able to leverage a lot of the features, especially the scheduler and the, and, and, you know, the, the, the payment portal through Clio and the law pay and all of those things have completely eliminated the need for, for um, administrative support staff that, that usually I would have had to do that. And so it's so instant, it's so quick, and it, it allows me to then offer my services at a, at a more competitive rate. But the amazing thing is I'm not making any less money than the old traditional way of practice. And, and so sometimes people think, oh, technology, yes, I need to offer my fees lower at a lower rate to be more competitive. It's not about that. It's all about focusing on how to better service the client and, and, and just, you know, you know, trying to get them in and out as quickly as possible. And, and then they become raving fans, right? They, you know, they, they then are your best marketers. And so I've never been a paid, paid marketing kind of guy. I've, you know, when you provide awesome service, the thing that's going to separate us uh, firms that are client centered from those that aren't is the referrals. And, you know, people are on an on-demand world. And if you can meet that, they're going to tell the world and, you know, on their social platforms at, about how awesome you are. And that's been really the secret to our success. You touched on it earlier, but that, that flywheel, uh, you, you invest in that and you get that flywheel of referrals and repeat business and online reviews and all the other uh, halo effects of delivering really amazing client experiences. And you, you kind of don't need to worry about anything else. The rest will take care of itself. Exactly. That's exactly right. Just treat, you know, and in a way, within our firm, we try to treat our clients like family, you know, and, and when you talk about what are the rewards, how, what is my measure of success? It's when I get an email from a client who I've worked with six, seven months ago, and, and they send this, this, you know, this email just full of appreciation and gratitude for, for what we've done for them and their family and their future. And there is definitely high stakes with immigration. And especially when you have individuals that have used a different you know, representative, and they thought their hopes and dreams were, were gone, were shattered, and, and were able to step in and fix it. And that's what we are, right? Lawyers are fixers. And uh, that's definitely the thing that's motivated me. I, I was on the mergers and acquisition floor at the big national firm when I started. I hated it. You know, I, you sat in an office, you worked with paper, no human interaction. And then on the litigation side, it was so contentious and no one was happy at the end. But immigration right. was the best of both worlds genuinely appreciative of clients for, for what you did for them. And so, yeah, that's been one of the reasons I've, I've stuck with this. I'm, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned access to justice earlier. Uh, it's, it's gotta be uh, interesting and, and important time to be an immigration lawyer. Can you tell us a little bit about the, you know, macro level trends you're seeing in, in your practice area right now? And, you know, in particular, how Canadian immigration has been impacted by uh, the, the pandemic. Yeah. So obviously with a traditional law firm being unable to meet with your clients in person was a huge, huge issue. And I think more so for the litigators, you know, those that were going to court the hearings when the, when everything was closed, I felt so sorry for them. Slowly the government is coming around and they're, they're starting to modernize their systems and allow for virtual hearings. And ironically, a lot of this stuff should have happened years ago and the pandemic has forced the government's hand. And, um, and so I see, I see a, a really positive benefit from this really negative experience. And for lawyers, it's no different. The firms that were just operating in the old way are having to, to step forward. Otherwise they're gonna get left behind. And, um, and so just being a part of, of that solution and not only working with the lawyers to help educate them, which we do in our, you know, our Canadian Bar Association conferences at, at the options and things that are available, but also working with government. And that's one of the things that I love the most being a part of the Canadian Bar Association is the ability to liaise with them and to talk about solutions and offer suggestions on ways that they can better offer their you know, their, their, their programs in a way that people can, can, um, can navigate regardless of, you know, being in a paper-based world, which has really been the problem, right? The paper-based applications. So, yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the new world, I guess, that we're pushing to. And whether you like it or not, you know, you, you're going to, you're going to get shoved in that direction. And when you think about the, the kind of structural changes that need to take place over the next three to five years, do you have a, a view of where you'd like to 
to see things change. It, it sounds like you're trying to almost blaze a bit of a trail for the, the rest of the uh, industry to, to recognize in terms of a new way of, of thinking about delivering client experience and delivering client service. Uh, where would you like to see things get to in, in, in the next three to five years? Yeah, that's, that's something I've thought a lot about. And, you know, one of the impediments you know, being a, being a lawyer, I have the Law Society, which they serve a really important purpose, <laughs> but they're also a stifler of innovation. And so a lot of lawyers are really afraid to, to go out and like I do a live Q&A every, you know, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. on my YouTube channel where people post questions and I answer them. And I have to be careful that I'm not giving legal advice, but that it's information. But for a lot of lawyers, they get really concerned about the potential liabilities and those kinds kinds of things of giving information away that could be relied upon to someone's detriment. And so um, I would love to see a world where, where lawyers were not afraid to teach, to educate, because we are the holders of that knowledge. And there's some wonderful non-lawyers out there that are authorized to represent individuals in Canada, but there is a real, real need for information that can be trusted. And if us as immigration lawyers are not providing it, who's going to do it? And so I think we need to step past those barriers and be willing to, you know, to kind of push the envelope because we drive our industry, we drive our profession. And if we're always fearful of, of doing anything innovative because it's somehow going to, you know, create some risk or, or liability, I think that's our biggest problem. Um, I know others have different views on, on this, but that's okay. I would rather be the trail, you know, the trailblazer. I'd rather be ahead and, and doing all the things that I'm doing um, because it's not just about, you know, lining my firm with this steady stream of clients. It's about making a difference in the world, which sounds so, oh my goodness, really? You're saying that seriously? But it's actually how I feel. That's what drives me. I want to be able to look back and say, wow, you know, look at all this free information that's out here to help us. And, um, and you know, uh, and, and that's what it's about for me. I'm curious if there's a, a mindset shift that you went through yourself kind of on that, you know, that journey, there is so much inertia around how, how lawyers approach the delivery of legal services. Um, and and there, it's, it's such a precedent driven profession in, in, in all the senses of the, the word. Did you find that you had a definitive moment where you, you realized the, the status quo is kind of broken and there's a, a big opportunity here and maybe share what, what your personal kind of transformation went from, from, from being maybe a little bit more traditional and in how you approach things to thinking about things in a more, in a more innovative way. Cause I, I think that's, that's a breakthrough moment that more and more lawyers are looking to, to, to realize, but maybe aren't quite sure how to get there. Everything has been based on one question, Jack, why not? And um, when, I, when I look back, it's interesting. When I started my practice, I was exclusively business immigration. I worked for, as a contract a lawyer to global business immigration firms. I worked for some of the largest multinational companies in the world out of my little home, you know, office in Lethbridge. And, um, and, uh, and that was my practice. There was a steady stream of work and then the, the world shifted. You know, the big four accounting firms started to, um, you know, started to, to swallow up all of the, the immigration, business immigration boutique firms, all of the national firms went global, and I refused to join them. I didn't want to do it, but I'm in Lethbridge. And it's one thing to, to work with somebody who's transferring from Amsterdam to Toronto, and another to work with individuals who are used to, you know, having the person in front of them. And so I had to shift. I didn't want to move from Lethbridge. I wanted to raise my family here. So I saw social media. I, I read my first book. I think it was David Meerman Scott. I can't remember what it was. The New Rules of Marketing and PR, I think I read. And, and it opened my eyes to this new way of helping people to see, to know, you know, to understand that I know what I'm talking about and to choose to hire me, even though I don't live in the same location. So that was the shift for me. When I realized that there's this whole new way of marketing that would require me to give away the knowledge that I had and then I had to face those questions. Well, what about potential liability? You know, what about all these things the law society says I have to be careful with? 
So lots of discussions with practice advisors, you know, creating do-it-yourself guides. Um, and then I realized that everyday lawyers will go to these in-person conferences where maybe their potential clients are there asking specific questions and they're answering them. So why in the world can I not go online, you know, Facebook Live, whatever it is, why can't I answer them? And so that was my, that was always been what's driven what I've done. Why, why not? And um, yeah, but that was the shift for me, really. So I love that. And, and that's such a, a powerful way to, to shift into a, kind of a, a growth mindset, I guess, and, and look at opportunity rather than limitations. Uh, Mark, I, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, maybe to, to wrap up, it's been a chaotic time for the legal industry and, and, and for the world at large, obviously. Uh, and, you know, I, I think in particular, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, it's a, a backdrop of a lot of, you know, economic and personal devastation, but also for, for the legal industry, maybe a unique moment to think about how does it reinvent itself and how does it start to think about things in, in new and innovative ways. And I'm, I'm curious what parting thoughts you might have for, for our guests in terms of leaning into what might be some of the positive aspects of this, this pandemic when they think about uh, delivering access to justice and, and improving access to justice. Yeah, that's, I love that question. The answer for me is, is all in the fact that as lawyers, we are problem solvers. When there is a problem, that's where we shine, right? We may not be the most efficient at running, you know, this lean operation, but my goodness, we are awesome at solving problems. And when something like this pandemic hits, we're at the forefront of solutions. And like you said, this, this growth mindset, just, it really should infuse all of us. Unfortunately, we're trained not to be that way. We're not, Jack. Like we're, we, we, we are trained to be risk averse, to yeah. avoid anything like that, to play it safe, to be cautious. But when a pandemic hits, um, there, there are solutions to, to problems that were never there before that we can present that can set us up as, as really leaders to help navigate our way out of this. And um, you just have to stop for a second, just sit back, take some time to just shut your laptop down, turn your phone off and just think, think about the problems that your clients are telling you and what's the secret to content marketing. It's just ask questions, figure out what the questions, you know, the, the, the people, uh, the problems that they're experiencing and then give them a solution. It's so easy, really. And it's the same way in the pandemic. You can look around, you can see the problems your clients are having. Okay, we'll figure out the solution. And, and as long as we take that mindset, we're never going to be left behind. We're going to be at the forefront. And lawyers that do that will be successful. And others that don't want to change, well, there's other, other professions, I guess, or other things you can do <laughs> other than the practice of law. I love it. It's a, a great note to end on. And, and Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, fantastic conversation. Best of luck on uh, continued success of your firm and uh, look forward to staying in touch. Thanks. Appreciate it so much, Jack. Thanks for joining us on Daily Matters, a podcast from Clio. Rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Daily Matters is produced by Andrew Booth, Sam Rosenthal, and Derek Bolin, and hosted by yours truly, Jack Newton. Thanks also to Clio, the world's leading cloud-based legal technology provider for supporting this podcast.